I promised Edith to, to somehow uh, address some of the issues she raised because she had some comments about the previous that we had before. So if you can indulge me with uh, uh, a few of your minutes of your time, we'll, we'll go through that. So there are three issues that need to address which she kind of uh, stated in the remarks she had in, in, in YouTube. Uh, I think uh, under three headings, so it will be more organized, I'd like to address entire sanctification, which is sinless perfection, uh, very much uh, known as the last generation theology within our denomination. There's also exclusivism, which is a concept of the remnant. Are we the remnant church? How do we view ourselves as the remnant? And I see Jesus, which is like you have Ellen White and you have the scriptures. How do I use Ellen White uh, properly so that I, he, she's not mishandled? She's not misread, and we, she, she actually functions the way uh, she expressed herself uh, when she was called by God. Okay, so let's, let's address the first part. So this is last generation theology. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above or to stand in the sight of the holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of the sprinkling. So basically, as we studied early on in our movement about the, the sanctuary motif uh, and the pre-advent judgment, we, we talk about this, that after, in the Day of Atonement, the high priest eventually leaves the most holy place, and we equate that in our interpretation to the close of probation. And of course, we say there you'll stand without the mediator, will there be no more priest? And then the... After looking at the cleansing uh, of the sanctuary within the Day of Atonement, we kind of understood that to be, hey, the, the people must be spotless. They must be sinless so that they, might, they, they can go to the judgment of Yom Kippur. Uh, of course, that led into uh, a mindset within the Adventist Church, which is spearheaded by one of the most influential theologians in history, M. L. Andreasen. He says, Thus Christ, through the remnant's victory, must defeat Satan in order to fully and finally vindicate God's demand for perfect obedience. And this end time vindication of God will finally enable Christ to come. The faithful remnant would develop sinless characters that would replicate the sinlessly perfect life which Christ had wrought out in the very same fallen sinful nature in which the final generation will have to come. Um, so, M. L. Andreasen for years, decades in the church, impacted the church a whole lot. And because of the sanctuary motif, the, the, the orientation that we had as a movement after 1844, he resonated with so many people. And the, the emphasis has been how I can reach sinless perfection so that Jesus Christ can come back. Unfortunately, if you read the history of the church, uh, in 1961, the denomination, the church, was forced to remove the credentials of M. L. Andreasen, and they gave two reasons for the action that they took. Uh, number one, for bringing discord and confusion into the ranks by voice and pen, and for refusing to respond favorably to the appeals to make statement of his differences to John Conference, except on his own particular terms. Of course, the church has veered towards being more Christ-centered and gospel-centered rather than law-centered. Uh, and because of that, uh, in our study of the scriptures, like Ellen White herself, we matured in understanding what the Bible and salvation is all about. So while, while this was going on, they, they saw a stark contrast with what M. L. Andreasen was trying to promote within the church. So they, they invited him to have a dialogue with the church, but they, they, they started the campaign of M. L. Andreasen against the Adventist church. And they gave him so many opportunities to do it. They say, yeah, I, I will not present my statement unless you do it on my own terms. That's what he said. He was very belligerent uh, to a point where after several times they gave him an opportunity and, uh, you know, a chance to come and dialogue with the brethren, and the leadership of the church. And he wouldn't. Uh, they said, we got to do something because there's so much discord and confusion in the church already. Uh, and uh, I, I'm addressing because Edith was basically telling him, uh, you don't, don't do discord in the church and because of LGBT. I, I want to make sure it's in the context uh, that what caused discord and confusion in the church was the issue of LGBT. And Emma Landry hasn't pushed that. The good news is that uh, if you read the last part of his life when he was dying, 
he was able to reconcile with the GC president. They had a wonderful uh, time together and she, he was able to die in peace. Uh, it was about remuneration and the benefits that he had as a worker in the denomination. They never really settled what LGBT was all about. So uh, the fact that this, is, this has been written, I, I gave the link, you can do the documentation right there. If you look, you ask what Adventism is all about. Adventism is not LGBT. If you look at history and objectively look into what's going on in our understanding of salvation. In fact, um, the incumbent president, Ted Wilson, was asked, and I already shared this in the slides, what do you think about LGBT, last generation? Yeah, I don't think we need another big discussion about perfection that took place a dec few decades ago. The spirit of prophecy is very clear that no one should claim perfection. So, as opposed to the, the, the banner doctrine of last generation theology that we can be sinlessly perfect before Jesus comes back, this we will live without any mediator. And even the spirit of prophecy, says the incumbent president, is very clear that uh, we should never claim perfection. I mean, is there any biblical basis to this? Um, of course, 1 John 1, 8 and 10 are the most explicit verses that tells us that sinless perfection is not the goal, okay? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Uh, let's look at what Ellen White herself said, and this is my favorite parts of the Steps of Christ, pages 64 and 65. It said, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clear and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. See, that's the paradox of the Christian life. The closer you walk with Christ every day, you know, as you grow, the more you will see his perfection and his beauty and his glory and, and the more filthy you become in your own eyes. So what's the testimony of somebody really close to Jesus? Is somebody who sees his utter sinfulness. Like Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners, despite the fact that he was on his way to, to give his life for the gospel. In fact, this is a continuation of the same paragraph. It says, but if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had the view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. See the paradox? The more you see I'm progressing towards sinless perfection, that I'm really getting better now, it is evidence, says Ellen White, that you have not really seen the beauty of Jesus Christ. Because if you do, you will see yourself more sinful. Because you don't treat sin only in terms of not doing things or doing things, and not in terms of works and obedience. You see sin in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus is perfect. We're not. We are only, we are only perfect in Him. So he said, Christ is our pattern. I highlighted this in the Review and Herald, February 5. You know, we, we are called to, to make Christ our pattern, but we can never equal the pattern. Okay? He, he's not primarily our example. He's our Savior, basically. And then none of the apostles and the prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Okay? Uh, you can read the rest of this, but basically you read the, the testimonies and you read the Bible, the, the trajectory of the Christian life and discipleship is not to claim sinless perfection. Instead, you know, the direction is to come closer to Christ. And the closer you come to Christ, like Isaiah, you will only say, woe is me for I'm undone. I mean, my righteousness is like filthy rags. You know, Andreasian theology required also that Christ's human nature be the fallen nature shared by human beings born after Adam's sin. Why? Why? Because if Christ's your example and our goal is to be perfect like Jesus, Jesus must be totally like us. So Jesus must have a sinful nature, a fallen nature of Adam. This is a long ongoing battle. But the roots of this is against sinless perfectionism. Okay? And of course, Ellen White said this. Be careful, exceedingly careful as to how you dwell upon the human nature of Christ. Do not set him before the people as a man with the propensities of sin. Okay, you can read this, but basically even Ellen White said this, you got to be careful because remember, for Christ, sin is not a violation of the law. Sin is a hard issue. You know, what did she say? You have heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but if you hate your brother in your heart, you have said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but if you lust after one in your heart, you already committed. It's a hard issue, which is a propensity, a mindset. So in other words, before you even act out the sin, you can already sin in your heart, in your tendency. And because we are sinful in our natures, that is our natural bent, our propensity, our natural inclination. Jesus did not have that. 
You know, Jesus doesn't have to have an explicit violation of the law in order to sin. If, if in fact that's the way we're talking about that Jesus had no sinful nature, he had no propensity. And when you do that, he will not be our savior anymore. So, I know I'm going really fast and hopefully we have more time to process this. Most of this will take several sessions you know, in, in, in discussing. In fact, LGBT alone will take several sessions, but I'd like to just respond to those comments. Now, in, in terms of the, the remnant issue, do we believe that we are the remnant? Oh, yeah, we, in fact, they're, they're, we believe that we are a chosen movement in the last days. But you got to understand what that election and choosing is. It's not in terms of salvation, where we say we are the only people who's going to be saved. No, it is an election towards service and proclamation. We are elected in the last days to proclaim the three angels' messages. And therefore, you cannot go ahead and say, okay, because we're proclaiming the three angels' messages, we're the only ones going to be saved. I confess that to you when I was in school, my trajectory was, hey, you know, we are, these are your marks of the remnant church. We're the remnant church. Come out of Babylon. If you do not come and join us, you will not be safe. I don't think if you understand exactly the concept of the remnant, uh, that is the case. Remember when I, I said this, we studied the covenants, okay? After we, we, we studied the covenants, we, we studied Isaiah. And you know, the, the people of God were called by God. And what, what did God tell Abraham for, for starters? In you shall all the nations be blessed. In other words, the purpose of the remnant is to bless all nations or to give the good news to all nations. That's why I love this. It's one of the best diagrams that I saw in terms of the remnant concept and where we play a role in, in the movement in these last days. This is from Jack Provence. It didn't come from me. Excellent article if you can. Jack is gone now, but... He did an excellent article on this. But because basically he said, it's a Venn diagram. You got the world, okay? And within the world, you see a church invisible. The church invisible is a true church. Those people who will really eventually be in the kingdom of God, okay? And within the church visible, we have, uh, we have the church invisible right there. The church visible is what you see, okay? And then the, 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 it's composed of people who are really saved and not saved, people only professing and not real. So that's a big church. And the church invisible within the church visible are the, the people who will really be saved in the kingdom. Okay? And the way we understand this, and then it's a very, very keen observation by Jacques Provence. In the last days, there will be a prophetic minority. Okay? What was it called? Why is it prophetic minority? Because they will prophesy. Prophet is to proclaim. Okay? The end time remnant is called to proclaim the end time message. And that is a role as the Advent movement in the last days, it to proclaim the three angels' messages. And we are a prophetic minority because we, we, we preserve a lot of the truths that makes Christ more glorious and more beautiful. We, we talk about the Sabbath, we talk about the state of the dead, you know, to reclaim the, the primitive faith of the church when it was planted in Acts. Okay? But you gotta understand, not all of the prophetic minority are in the church invisible because there's a lot of Adventists today who proclaims it and yet they really believe more in the church rather than believe in Jesus Christ. And um, as long as we look at this diagram, I think we'll, we will see where we are. They, they, they put notes there. There is a call to proclamation to commission, not to salvation. And there's a part of the end time remnant, but not part of the invisible church, which is the call to salvation, right? Where did this come from? A quick background, you know, remember the Shatter Court Doctrine that we believed after 1844, no one else would be saved except for those who waited in October 22, 1844 for Jesus to come back. <coughs> in, in Selected Messages, <coughs> Volume 1, page 74. With my brother and sisters after the time passed in 44, 1844, I did believe no more sinners would be converted, but I never had the vision that no more sinners would be. Even Ellen White said this, she believed Somehow with the brethren, the shut door controversy. The shut door means the door has been shut like the door in Noah's Ark. You can't go in anymore. Only those who waited for Jesus in the great disappointment will be saved. In November 1848, she had the vision in which she saw the three angels' messages like streams of light clear around the world. Her vision clearly showed that the new converts could be made in the moment. So here comes proclamation right here. Even Ellen White was said, oh, you got to proclaim the three angels' message because there's a lot of people that need to be blessed. In you shall all the world be blessed. 
the calling of the remnant basically is to bless the world for proclamation, not so much a monopoly of salvation. Uh, so, but you're a chosen race, this is what the Bible says, a royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people, this is the basis of what the, ch the choosing of the remnant in the last day, the choosing of the church. What's the purpose of that election? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. The Bible is basically saying, hey, the election that you read in the Bible is not so much the election to salvation in, in, in terms of the church. It is an election to service, an election to proclamation. Now, there, there's a very comprehensive uh, document that was published by the Biblical Research Institute, uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Church Understanding Allen White's Authority. Okay, and this is one of uh, there's there's affirmations and denials. I'd like to read this, which will help us out. And I highlighted the, the some some of the stuff we know that Allen White is not an addition to the canon. But the number four, we do not believe that the writings of Allen White may be used as the basis for doctrine. Okay. Why, why did they say this? Because Sister Edit made a comment that uh, we should be using the Allen White notes. And it's true, I mean, it, it's very helpful. It's very interesting. If you look at the teacher's edition for this week, uh, there is no quotations from Allen White in the teacher's edition. Uh, normally, the Thursday day lesson, that's where we start quoting more of Allen White. But at least if you look at the editorial um, uh, uh, approach to our last inquiry, that's what happened. Ellen White was not meant to be an inspired commentary. And we'll talk about that some more because she, he cannot, she cannot be the basis for doctrine. She herself said that it must only be the Bible. Um, we do not believe that scripture can be understood only through the writings of Ellen White. Ellen White saying, go back to your Bible, and when you go back to your Bible and your, your vantage ground, then you can come and read me. You know? Um, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White are essential for the proclamation of truth scripture to society at large. You know, when, when, when you, I know this is uh, Sabbath School lesson study among us, among Adventists, that's good. But the moment we start sharing the good news, you don't use Ellen White when you do evangelism, when you reach out to people. Uh, you preach the gospel from the word. Okay, uh, let's, Let me address that very quickly. Um, about 99.2% of COVID-related deaths since the beginning of 2020 had been among unvaccinated individuals. This whole issue about vaccination and refraining from vaccination has been afflicting us. Uh, and there's an, an, uh, um, an article on this in the Adventist Review about how the church should be reacting. One recent view has put forward the theory that the upcoming vaccines produced to combat COVID-19 will lead to the application of the mark of the beast. There are a lot of people in the denomination, and they use Ellen White to do this, to say people should not be vaccinated. And the problem is they have been aggressively going to the pulpits and to the brethren to do this and to discourage members not to be vaccinated. Just within our conference, I won't mention the name of the church explicitly. Um, one church basically disqualified a whole lot of uh, the school athletic teams just because a couple got COVID. Why? Because the church didn't believe in vaccination. There's another church where some people already died here because they didn't believe in vaccination. They opened up the church, they didn't quarantine, uh, and the, the conference had to intervene. Now, I just got this note from the Philippines. It's the Southern Philippine Union Conference one of the largest conferences in scriptures. This is an action from the, from the board, okay, to enjoin our churches within SPEC territory to deny anyone the pulpit if his intention is to give information contrary to the position of our church, which favors the administration of the vaccine against COVID-19. Of course, in, in, in the discussion, they knew that Ellen White herself got immune, immunized and vaccinated for smallpox. And this is an explicit statement from one of our unions, at least in the Philippines, to stop anybody from occupying the people to do conspiracy theories and discourage vaccination. In fact, to, you, you should read this, and uh, the, our site already, actually, the Seventh-day Adventist just places strong emphasis on health, and they basically said, we encourage responsible immunization. We are not the conscience of the individual church member and rec recognize individual choice. These are exercised by the individual. The individual choice not to be immunized is not and should not be seen 
as a dogman or the doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist is one thing that you can have your free choice to do this. But it's quite another to go in the churches and tell churches, if you are vaccinated, you're complicit to the mark of the beast. Why am I saying this? Because people use Alan White today to do that, to disrupt the church. Why? Because we can mishandle Ellen White. If you mishandle, you're doing her a big disservice. Her ministry to the church that has helped her denomination will be in disrepute if you do that, if you mishandle it. One, one example in mishandling Ellen White is this, the milk question about dairy products. Over 25 years, it's repeated by William White. Ago, the matter was presented before mother that cattle would become too so diseased that we should abandon the use of milk before the Lord comes. Dr. M. C. Kellogg, Dr. Kellogg himself, hearing this, presented to his father, urging immediate action. And Father Kellogg sold his cow. He had a large family of children that had depended largely upon the milk, and there was no one who knew how to cook properly and economically without it. When mother learned that the cow had been sold, she advised Father Kellogg to buy it back again, which he did. So you read things like this, and unless you understand the intent of what Ellen White says, you can mishandle and even put your family and your loved ones in jeopardy. We can also misquote Ellen White, Seventh-day Adventist urged to leave the United States. A statement that the day is coming and is not far off when every Seventh-day Adventist will wish that he were out of the United States. has been incorrectly attributed to Ellen G. White. It is part of a sermon by A.T. Jones published in the General Conference Bulletin on April 16th. There is a big tendency in our church to just name drop. You get Ellen White and attach the Ellen White to any coat, even if it didn't come from her. So we got to be careful because you, you don't only mislead people, you even put Ellen White in a bad light when you do that. And there's also a misreading of Ellen White. Fundamentals of Christian education. Somebody reason, plunging into amusements, mass games, pugilistic performances the, the students of Battle Creek College declared to the world that Christ was not their leader in any of those things. All this called for the warning from God. <coughs> so he said, oh, there you go. Ellen White says we should have no athletic competitions in our schools. All right. And we read on. Now that which bears it me is the danger of going into extremes on the other side. So she talks about extremes in the, the same book, Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 378. If they would gather the children close to them and show that they love them and would manifest an interest in all their efforts, even in their sports, sometimes even being a child among children, they would make the children very happy, would gain their love and win their confidence. So like studying the Bible, you got to study it in context and avoid extremes. And if we miss being best, Ellen White, we, we miss the, the special gift that God has given in her. Uh, Coming to a very important, and that, that really hit me when, when I read the comments that uh, George Knight and Edward Happenstall is just trying to marry evangelicalism and Adventism. Um, there's a very big danger when we start uh, looking to what I call exclusivism. We're just the people of God. We're the only people who will be saved in the end. You know, if you're not part of the remnant, this is why I call it sectarianism, because we have a parochial God, we have a monopoly of salvation, we have a monopoly of truth. The moment you say that, it, it, there's a very big danger to be sitting in the judgment seat and start naming people and pigeonholing them and labeling them as such. Uh, George Knight has done a very big, big service to the church. And he is part of what I call the Doma gifts in Ephesians 4.11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. These are gifts of people of the Holy Spirit. There are several, there are three kinds of gifts in the New Testament. You read the Spirit, when we study this in the Holy Spirit. In the Charismata, uh, Phaneros, and Doma, you know. You get the manifestation gifts, the charismatic gifts, and these are Doma, the people gifts. In order to build the church, the Spirit gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, because not all of us have those gifts. But because we have prophets and teachers and evangelists in our, in our ranks, we are able to understand the Bible better 
to their ministry. It gives them, we're called and equipped to lead and train the rest of the body of Jesus. They're part of the body. Even if you're not an apostle, or, of course, there's no one apostle. If you're not a prophet and evangelist, there are prophets and evangelists. I always say that we're one and a half hours away from Andrews University, and we are privileged to be able to invite some of our professors and teachers from Andrews to help us out here. Why did God give this? Because he knows that we need these people to be dependent in understanding what the scripture is about. So let's go back here. George Knight was recently given an award. George Knight recognizes probably the most prolific author since Ellen White. Let's, let, let's get, I think Ellen White wrote about 40 books during her 87 years. Uh, but more than 100 titles, you know, you know what we did. The, the, uh, uh, Ellen White wrote 40 books, but we compiled stuff. And out of that, we came up with another 100 titles of her books, which is not straight from what Ellen White actually wrote. We just compiled them. We nitpick whatever we wanted to do and put them together in books. And you read George Knight, he, he describes all of this. But basically, George Knight wrote 37 books. That's why she, he probably was the most prolific author outside of Ellen White in their denomination. He was given a, an award to Maverick. There was a book dedicated to him with a lot of our uh, scholars and our teachers writing, uh, recognizing what he has done as a contribution to the church. And he, of all the books that he has written, he considers this to be his magnum opus. This is the masterpiece that he wrote. In less than 100 pages, an apocalyptic vision and neutering of Adventism. I read this in one sitting. Yeah, I was an Adventist for 14 years before I became a Christian. Since then, my life has been dedicated to helping other people understand who Jesus is. Let's never forget who are, we are in relationship to Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. What am I saying here? George Knight struggled with last generation theology. And... He promised God that he would be the first perfect Seventh-day Adventist. And in all the churches that he pastored, that was his goal to, to make his congregation sinlessly perfect. And after a while, it didn't work. It just didn't work. It, it resulted in spiritual depression. The teaching was, the closer you are to sinless perfection, the closer is Jesus coming back. He's going to return. If, if, if we can reach sinless perfection, the second coming will, will come sooner than later. So he did that. But in reality, if you're honest with yourself, and I've already asked a lot of people about this, if you're honest with yourself, don't you realize that the more you try to be perfect, the less perfect you become? And if you believe that it is your perfection that will usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ, what happens then? If you're honest with yourself, and every time you try to be perfect, the less perfect you become, the farther away Jesus' return would be. And it becomes an endless loop, a cycle, that leads you into a spiritual depression. In fact, that's what happened to George Knight. He had to turn in his ministerial credentials because he couldn't do it. This is not working, he said. And then obviously, eventually he found that Christ is at the center of Adventism. And he came back to be one of the more powerful instruments in the church to lead us into understanding our history and understanding who Jesus is. He dedicates his life so that people can understand who Jesus is, following exactly what Ellen White has counseled us to do to make Jesus the center of our movement. So it really concerns me a whole lot when we pigeonhole him because it doesn't jive with LGT that, God forbid, the implication is that George Knight will not be safe. But the fact that we say that George Knight is trying to do a disservice to the church when in fact he's trying to lead the church of Jesus Christ, I think is consistent to what Alan White has told us. When I do seminars and preaching among pastors because I'm a firm believer in biblical preaching. This is one of the, the diagrams that I give the pastors when, when you start preparing your sermons, you study the Bible, this is what you do. You need to have a teachable spirit and then you do your self-study yeah, you do, just don't depend on others. But, and then you depend on the gifted teachers that's available to you. Then of course you'll depend on God. This is a cycle that you do, so you do the context of the immediate setting, the context of normal usage, the context of the whole Bible, and the context of foundational truths. Um, so by doing this, you utilize what the Spirit has given in the gifts of pastors, teachers, and evangelists in the church to help you understand. 
So this is my concern. It has been brought up that, uh, you know, I thought it was Patrick who responded. Uh, uh, Patrick basically said, you know, I, I read the comments, uh, the notes of Ellen White notes about the quarterly. Okay? And, and uh, of course, Eddie was saying, I, I don't read it anymore because I want to study the Bible for myself. Uh, it's very difficult the way the Spirit has designed the church to be to just study the Bible through yourself. I mean, yes, if you say you, you need to study personally the Bible, that's true. But what we're saying is you cannot just study the Bible and understand it just with your background. You need the rest of the church to help you, the body of Jesus, to understand it. And it comes in the form of teachers, evangelists, and prophets within the church. I mean, about Ellen White, you will be surprised to know that Ellen White herself consulted a lot of other authors, not just herself. The, the, the concept of, of inspiration in Ellen White was not a dictation from God. It was the messenger was inspired. It was not the words that were inspired. So we call it thought inspiration. That's, that's coming from Ellen White. So this is what's interesting. I'll give you some slides. In the great controversy itself, in some cases where historian is so grouped together events as to afford a brief of comprehensive view of the subject as well as summarized details in a convenient manner, his words have been coded. In narrating the experience and views of those carrying forward the work of reform in their own time, similar use has been made of their public works. Um, Ellen White, in the great controversy, quoted copiously from Mel de Aubigny, uh, a lot of historians. Okay? Um, not only the great controversy, Ellen White wrote sketches from the life of Paul. The life of St. Paul by William John Conybeer and John Saul Hawson, I regard as a book of great merit and one of very usefulness to the early student of the New Testament history. A ton of these books, this, Ellen White had to grab, grab a ton of the words from this book to write sketches from the life of Paul from these two Protestant writers. They are non-Adventist writers because Ellen White knew how to read What's important by reading that to determine that this is consistent with what God wants me to express. Ellen White also used materials from 23 other literary works in the Desire of Ages. Notably, the great teacher of Jan Harris, a congregational pastor, which she personally treasured in her own library. Jan Harris was chairman of the Congregational Union of England and Wales. Fred Veltman, who conducted the most comprehensive analysis of the Desire of Ages, to call it the Desire of Ages project, to understand the borrowings, the literary borrowings of Ellen White, had this to say. Okay, by the way, not because Ellen White borrowed from other, other authors means she wasn't inspired. The way we read the Bible, because a lot of the prophets in the Bible quotes from other works. Some of them even quotes from the Apocrypha. But basically this, the, the conclusion that Fred Veltman said, the books in Ellen White's library at the time of her death appeared to corroborate what her writings revealed. She read widely in works of different thing, differing literary type, theological perspective, and scholarly depth. Even the ministry of Ellen White within the church was not done in isolation. She was moved to depend on other Bible teachers who were gifted by the Spirit to make the words of God clear and more plain to those who reads. So we, I'd be very careful to say that I can just read the Bible without depending on other authors, even if Ellen White depended on other authors. I, I guess the point that we need to do is we've got to be settled on the Bible first and allow ourselves to be guided to know that it is consistent with the Bible. That doesn't preclude us quoting and depending on people whom the Spirit is gifted to help us understand. I mean, my, my, always, my comment always, you look, look at the Seventh-day Adventist church hymnal. How many of those songs are written by Adventists? Most of those songs, I can count it with probably one hand or with just one hand, but most of those songs have been written by non-Adventists. We don't have a monopoly of music, nor, nor do we have a monopoly of truth. Uh, most important is whatever we sing, whatever we read must be consistent with God's word. Okay, another, Boy, I mean, this please uh, indulge me. The, the, this has been thrown lately that we are mar marrying evangelicalism and Adventism. Uh, and, and it's very, very difficult to make conclusions without 
right definitions. Okay, by, what do you mean by evangelical? Is it that a populist evangelical is about those people who storm the capital because they're, it's Trumpism, it's an evangelism that, that will change, an evangelicalism that will change America through political platforms? Uh, there's several views of evangelical. So we got to understand what evangelicalism is meant. So from the very core of the definition of evangelicalism, it's taken from Bebbington's Quadrilateral, and this, this, we talk about biblicism, bi biblicism activism, conversionism, I forget those technical terms. They're, all they're saying is to be an evangelical means to be centered in the cross, to recognize that the Bible is the supreme authority in, in doctrine and in life, uh, to understand that you need to be born again to accept Jesus Christ, and you need to share the gospel. That is what an evangelical is. So if that's the definition of evangelical, we all should be evangelicals. That's very biblical. Okay? Unfortunately, we try to affix evangelical with all sorts of groups today. And if you're saying we are trying to marry evangelical with Adventism, and you have a wrong uh, association of evangelical with Adventism, yes, you may be correct. But if you look at the very basic definition of evangelical, aren't we cross-centered? Don't we believe that the Bible is so grand of faith and practice? Don't we believe in sanctification and conversion and being born again, growing in the Spirit? Don't we believe in the Bible? We do. And from this standpoint, we are evangelicals. Okay, one thing else that I, I need to clarify. We don't have a monopoly of truth. That way, in the same way, we don't have a monopoly of salvation. There's what we call a, this, the Bible Sabbath Association. They gave this link to you. There's an association of seven-day Sabbath keepers. There, we are not the only ones keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath today. You look, there's a ton of lists, over 50 organizations today, keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, not just the Adventist Church, who recognize the Ten Commandments. We're not the only ones who believe in the state of the dead, that there's no dualism, that, that the soul is not immortal. John Stott, considered to be the father of evangelicalism, even said this, we need to survey the biblical material first. I do plead for a frank dialogue among evangelicals on the basis of scripture. I also believe that the ultimate annihilation of the wicked should at least be accepted as a legitimate, biblically founded alternate, alternative to their eternal conscious torment. Annihilationism, that's what we teach in the state of the dead, uh, the nature of men. Where is it coming from? Probably the best site in understanding eternal hellfire and the, the, the dualism of body and soul is rethinking hell. This is not an Adventist site. But if you want to understand more of the, the state of the dead and the true nature of man, this is an excellent site where you can go to. You can go into historicism, which is our approach to prophecy. We're not preterist, we're not futurist, okay? We're not idealist, we're historic. And those sites, again, are written and it's been established by non-SDAs because we do not have a corner on truth. And if you follow their lesson preview, one probably one of the best books written by Adventists on this whole thing is The Holy Adventism by Marcus Torres. In fact, if you read to SS, go to ssnet.org, he had a series on the covenants there. You probably be useful for you to read it. But the question he had when he wrote is, what if the message of Adventism was less about rules and more about grace? Less about religion and more about relationship. Less about us and more about him. Remember, we talk about this. There are three stories. You said the big story, the middle story, and the little story when we talk about the covenants. And these are the questions who is God? What is he like? The middle story is why is there evil? You talk about the great controversy in the middle, and then the little story about earth. And, and basically, the problem is because Adventists concentrates on the middle story, we don't look at the little story. So we didn't talk about, we talk about this in, during the quarter of the covenants. And this is what we've seen, you know, the, the breakdown, it becomes more mysterious. The way you go to the big story, it becomes more complex the, the more you go down. But this is the point. You cannot just have a hasty conclusion and say that all Protestants don't believe in the law and they do not keep the law. Why? Because we talked about this. There's category and category B. If you are in the Westminster Confession and Second London Baptist Confession, you embrace the perpetuity of the law and the Sabbath. We talk about this. So you understand the decalogue, you believe in the decalogue, you believe in the perpetuity of the Sabbath. Of course, a lot are Sunday keepers, and that's why Dr. Bakyoki contributed a lot. 
and there are tons. Dr. Bihar gave me over 100 mails where, where whole churches go to seven days Sabbath keeping after reading his book. Why? Because they still believe in the perpetuity, the continuity, and the validity of the Decalogue today. So most of the Protestant world still believes in the Decalogue and the Sabbath. You cannot just say, if you're not Adventist, you do not believe in the law. That, that, that is not just accurate. That's way off the mark. But yes, when you talk about dispensationalist and new covenant theology, we talk about this. There's fairly new schools of thought within Christendom. They reject the Decalogue and the Sabbath. And we talk about um, Don Carson, and uh, we talk about... Uh, our good friend uh, who wrote the Sabbath in Crisis, who an Adventist pastor who left the Adventist church. Yes, they belong to this. But let me tell you that this is fairly new. If you look at the classic and the orthodox view of Protestantism, the Bible is there and the Decalogue is there. So you cannot just say, hey, you're not an Adventist, you don't believe in the Decalogue and you don't keep the Sabbath. And I think that's way off the mark. If you look at the evidence, that is not really accurate. I want to be very clear about this too. We talk about this, we spend a whole quarter on how to study the Bible and I'm hoping that we got a lot from the quarter teaching us fundamental principles of properly understanding the Bible. Because if you misuse the Bible, you can mislead people instead of lead them to salvation. There are three stories in the Bible and the way we do it is what we call, you go to the story of 2,000 years ago, two, 3,000 years ago. Then we go to the story of Jesus and then how does it apply to my own story today, okay? So you got exegesis, you analyze the text, the culture, where it came from. Why do you do that? So that you can know exactly what the author was trying to say when the Holy Spirit inspired the author. You got to understand his context, what he was trying to do. You don't second guess him. Don't, you don't try to understand Jeremiah in terms of the 21st century. You got to go where he was in the 7th century BC. And then understand what the situation was, and then you can understand what the Holy Spirit was inspiring him to say. That's exegesis. And the moment you understand what the Holy Spirit was telling, talking, saying to Jeremiah, then you can assimilate the principles of Christ and theology and the, the general eternal principles of God that needs to be applied. And then once you get the principle, you can apply it to your own situation. Basically, this is it. There is a uh, a contrast between eisegesis and exegesis. Eisegesis is the interpreter makes the scripture say what he, he wants it to say. You go to the Bible because you already have something in your mind, you make the Bible support you. This is proof texting. I already have a conclusion, let the Bible support my conclusion. That's eisegesis. You read into the Bible. You're reading into the Bible. That's eisegesis. Exegesis, on the other hand, he says, I will not come with any conclusion. I will go to the Bible and allow the Bible to tell me what God has to say. You're reading it out of the Bible. And we can be guilty of ICGs both in the Bible and the study of Ellen White. Because you can read into Ellen White your prepositions in your head. If, you, if your preposition, uh, presupposition is M. L. Andreasen's Last Generation Theology and you read Ellen White, you will just pick the passages that will support your conclusion. But if you go in there and understand exactly what Ellen White or the Bible is trying to say and read out of what they're saying you can have a better handle that's a, a sound, the more sound, more correct interpretation of the passage. I, I, I just Let me just share this again to you. This, their story is the past in Bible study. You must understand that. You must understand the, what happened in the past, what the Holy Spirit was telling the inspired writer to write. <laughs> and then you have the eternal story, which is what the Spirit in Jesus wants us to apply, and then the present, how will it affect and impact my life? <laughs> John Pauline puts it really nicely. Um, Ellen White rarely uses scripture exegetically. You can talk about exegesis. As was the case with the classical prophets of, of the Old Testament, her main concern was to speak to her contemporary situation. This would generally cause her to use scripture theologically and homiletically rather than exegetically. So, so the, all the, the technical terms are there, but if you go back to what I said here, you will understand what we're trying to say. Ellen White's primary handling of the scripture is not exegesis. It's more homiletics. In other words, it's not exegesis, but devotional. 
And uh, let me give you an example of what he says. For instance, in the Ministry of Healing, page 335, in relation to tea and coffee, tobacco and alcoholic drinks, the only safe course is to touch not, taste not, and handle not. Okay? Of course, she is using Colossians 2.21. Okay? But it certainly is not about tobacco and health reform. Okay? Because see, if Paul is warning against the ascetism of the Gnostics during his time. Actually, Jesus will tell you, this is not about health reform. This is about pagan practices in Colossians, okay? But Jesus White uses it, not in terms of exegesis, but he uses it so that it is homiletical, he can apply it, you know? It's out of context, but the intent is good. That's the way devotionals are. It's not an exegesis. It'll give you a good thought. You go to the, to the middle story, which is the eternal story, his story, okay? But in terms of exegesis, that's not the best, this is not the best quote that you can use to understand Colossians too. Secondly, one of our favorites. Paul had a view of heaven, and the very best thing he could do was to not to try to describe him. He tells us that the eye had not seen nor ear heard, neither had entered into the heart of men the things which God had prepared for those that love him. So you may put your imagination to the stretch. You may try to the very best of your abilities to take in and consider the eternal weight of glory, and yet you find a sentence. Faint and weary with the effort cannot grasp it, for there is infinity. This is the notes of Ellen White in this SDA Bible commentary. He's basically saying, you cannot imagine what God is in store in heaven for you. That's true. But when you look at the context of 1 Corinthians 2, it, it, it's not heaven that Paul is trying to say. You know, I had not seen or ear heard what the Spirit is giving, but it has been revealed to you, but God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. It's talking about the current situation in the Corinthian church, where if they will allow the Spirit to talk to them, they will understand the deep things of God. But she uses this as a devotional. Is it true that we cannot imagine what this heaven is like? Sure. From a devotional standpoint, yes, it is. But when you read the exegesis of the background, that's not what 1 Corinthians 2 means. That doesn't mean Ellen White was wrong. She was giving a devotional thought. She wasn't doing an exegesis. <coughs> this is the reason why I do not quote a lot of Ellen White when we study the scriptures. And the reason why I do that because she is a devotional writer and the sound understanding of the Bible goes with exegesis first before we go to the devotionals. So where do I quote Ellen White? The moment we try to apply what we study in exegesis, then we can quote Ellen White with some of the beautiful words that she has written. And I hope you understand that when you start reading the Ellen White notes in the Sabbath school. Some real big quotes. Lay Sister White to one side, do not quote my words again as long as you live until you can obey the Bible. I exalt the precious word before you today. Do not repeat what I have said, saying, Sister White said this, Sister White said that. Find out what the Lord God of Israel says and then do what he commands. It's very explicit from Ellen White. Don't even quote me until you learn to study the Bible in your Do not make prominent and quote that which Sister White has written as authority to sustain your position. Well, can it be more explicit than that? To do this will not increase faith in the testimonies. Bring your evidences clear and plain from the word of God. And thus said the Lord is the strongest testimony you can possibly present to the people. Right, if you really believe in God's gift to Melon White and you believe in her counsel, these are very strong counsels from her. There is no excuse for anyone taking the position that there is no more truth to be revealed and that all our expositions of scripture are without an error. The fact that certain darkness have been held as truth for many years by our people is not proof that our ideas are infallible. Again, we'll not make an error into truth, and truth can afford to be fair. No true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. Prime example, we had 27 fundamental beliefs for the longest time, and then we added another fundamental belief as a people as we read more of the scriptures. Ellen White is the guide why we ended up doing that. I hear Sister White said this, or Sister White said that. My words are so rested and misinterpreted that I am coming to the conclusion that the Lord desires me to keep out of large assemblies and refuse private interviews. Even Ellen White expressed this frustration. She has been misused and mishandled in the church. What I say is reported in such a perverted light that it is new and strange to me. Even she finds the way she is used strange and perverted. It is mixed with words spoken by men to sustain their own theories. I pray to God that we don't do that. Let's use Ellen White the way she has counseled us to use her so that she can fulfill the gift of the Spirit the Spirit have given to her in his ministry through this movement. What This hit me. 
If you have made God's word your study, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple, direct testimonies. But Ellen Rice said, if you have been the people of the book, you will have been diligent in your Bible study. There would have been no need for testimonies. He basically said, you don't need the testimonies in order to understand a lot of the words. We needed Ellen White because without Ellen White, we won't have our institutions. It was because even Hinsdale Hospital right there, it, was, it happened because of Ellen White's counsel. I mean, a lot of our educational and medical institutions was there because Ellen White was a prophet to this movement. It helped us grow. But Ellen White is saying, in terms of Bible study, you would have not needed my comments on the Bible study if you only studied the Bible yourself. The Spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible, for the Scriptures explicitly state that the Word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Let me just summarize this. We never believe as a movement and denomination that Ellen White is an inspired Bible commentary. We cannot treat her as such. And if you read Ellen White notes in the Sabbath school lesson to determine doctrine, you are violating her counsel herself. You got to go to the Bible. And then when you treat Ellen White as a devotional note to the, to the lesson, then it will be more meaningful in terms of her counsel and advice to the church. And lastly, um, Sister Adit mentioned spiritual formation. And I basically said during the last lesson preview, which I led, a spiritual formation is another term for sanctification, which it is. Look at the text, Romans 12, 1 and 2, okay? I appeal to you, brethren, okay, which is your, what, the whole acceptable, your sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This is where they got this. You are formed spiritually by the Spirit. It's called spiritual formation by the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, I think there was an ambiguity. I think what Sister Edith meant is the spiritual formation movement. Okay, and there are two kinds, two types of spiritual formation today. There's what we call the biblical spiritual formation, spiritual formation formed by the Spirit based on what the Bible says. And there's the mystical monastic spiritual formation, which is the spiritual formation movement. Yes, if you think of spiritual formation in terms of the monastic and mystical that's just creeping into to our, to our Christian churches today. Yes, that's wrong. But there is spiritual formation in the Bible. Okay. You can go to the handouts. I'm going to give this to you. But these are three books that will be worth your while to read. A Time of Departing tells you exactly how this monastic and mystical spiritual formation movement is akin to Zen Buddhism and the Eastern mysticism. It tells you from the scriptures what, what some warnings. An excellent book by Edmund P. Clowney is Christian Meditation. Because we need to meditate, but we cannot meditate the way the Easterns do that and the Buddhists do that. There's a difference between meditation. The other book, which is an excellent, this is free. You can go to Tim Jennings. And I don't agree with a lot of what Tim Jennings says, but in this particular case, he actually, I think, made a big contribution to Christians. In fact, he was interviewed by Janet Parshall in the market in Moody right here. And he's, he's an Adventist teacher, Bible teacher. He's entitled Meditation of Biblical Method versus Eastern Method. These are, these are some books that you can read. In fact, if you can watch the video by Yip Kok To. Yip Kok To is a Zen Buddhist for 20 years who converted to Adventism. You can watch his videos to make you understand what true biblical medica med meditation is as opposed to this mystical and monastic meditation. Of course, these are the books, uh, Richard Foster, Celebration of Discipline, uh, Contemplative Lifestyle by John Duncan Oliver. Uh, these are the, the books that they use in the spiritual formation movement. So as long as you know where you are, you can still follow and you go back to what Mrs. White said. Go back to the Bible. Read the Bible and make the Bible the barometer, the measure of whatever you read, or what's, whichever book you have in your hand. Uh, Robert Kellerman it talks about uh, soul physicians. And it's probably one of the best books on counseling and the psychology of a Christian because he said, when you do counseling, it must be a trilogue. A trilogue is myself, the person I'm helping, and the Holy Spirit through God's Word. When I counsel somebody, the Bible must be their primary. Uh, this is a good 
advice um, written by the blogger Timmy Brister. Uh, he said, "This are what you need in spiritual formation. How do you? How are you sanctified? You need spiritual disciplines. Discipline comes from the word disciple. What are the habits that you cultivate in order for you to be sanctified?" They so said, "There are three prong: the prophet, priest, and king." Uh, well, roles of Jesus Christ. When it comes to priest, it's prayer. You need confession, fasting, silence, solitude. This is a Christian, okay? When it comes to prophet or proclamation, you need to read the Bible. You need your head, you know, from the heart to the head. You need Bible intake. You need meditation. You need scripture memory. You need journaling, okay? And then when it comes to the gospel of the kingdom, that's where your hands are. Evangelism, worship, mortification of sin, serving. Do you constantly support missions and outreach, you know? aside from reading the Bible and praying, this is spiritual formation. And this is biblical spiritual formation. And as long as you know your definitions, there is no danger when it comes to sanctification and understanding with it, regardless of what term is used. It must be based on the scriptures. And lastly, I'll just breeze through this. Um, there's also mention about King James Version, that only the King James Version is the accurate uh, Translation of the Bible. There are some issues there. Firstly, what do you do with people who were born before the King James Version was translated? Uh, what do you do to my people who some a lot, a lot of my countrymen who are Filipinos cannot read English? So what you do is translate the Bible into the vernacular. And in fact, the Bible has been translated into thousands of versions for various people groups within the world thousands of languages. Mind you, they didn't use the King James Version to translate the Bible. They used the Greek and the Hebrew to be closest to the original as possible. What's the most accurate translation of the Bible? Read it in Hebrew, read it in Greek. I don't know. I took a little Greek, but I really don't know Greek. I don't know a lot of Hebrew. So what do I do? I read it from several translations, and I read some people who comments, the gifted people that God gave, so I can understand it. Okay, and we talk about this before, word for word translation, thought for thought, and the paraphrase, the bottom line is the more you study the Bible in different translations, the more you can have a grasp of it. And by doing so, although my preference in most of my quotes here is the English Standard Version, I still read it, I read the New Living Translation, I need the Young's Translation, I read them, and whenever there's a transliteration of the, the, the Greek and the Hebrew, I take time to read the uh, the comments on those words to help me understand. But we cannot pigeonhole one translation to say, this is the only translation that you should use in order to understand the Bible. God has gifted the church with translators and teachers and writers to the Holy Spirit to preserve God's word so we can understand. Let's use what God has given us. Uh, this is um, the diagram of David Asherick. Uh, the distinctives of the uh, Adventist faith, the Sabbath, satanic conflicts, all S, they're very genius. You can, again, download this when I uh, upload the handouts, but this is the quotes from Testimonies to Ministers. The message of the gospel of his grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines that the world should no longer say that Seventh-day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe Christ. For a while, that was the impression of the world, that we only talk about the law, but we do not believe Jesus Christ. But I love this. Uh, I put the link here. I hope you will take time to watch this. One of the most powerful messages that David Asher gave was given in Australia. But it's entitled, a, Ch a Choice You Do Not Have to Make. Choosing between the Adventist message and the gospel is a choice you don't have to make because the message of the Adventist movement is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that was a mouthful, but hopefully you can review this and. and Sometime in the future we can deal with them in more detail.